Zoya will not reach a higher evolution without this, and I think he will never reach it, solely because of this one fact. Before I fully start the video, I just want to say a couple of things. First thing is thank you for watching my videos because I was able to hit YouTube Partner, and uh, that was a goal of mine that I'd been working on, and I was genuinely so happy to see that goal realized. And Recently, I did a reevaluation of my goal and what I want to see for this channel. And yeah, I just want to be better. I just want to do more things and uh, I want to push myself and this channel to be the best that it can be. I'm really grateful. Thank you. And second, some of you may be wondering where the 193 video is because this one is coming out without a 193 review. Well, the 193 chapter review will come after this one because I've been working on it for the past two weeks and the video has taken many, many shapes and I've edited it a lot and I'm incredibly happy with it. Don't get me wrong, but that video is insane. And if you're not already subscribed and you have the bell hit to be notified, I would suggest you do it now because kind of a humongous bomb in terms of the realization I had. So let's get started with the video. Ah, another chapter where we are subjected to Noya, but thankfully Noya's presence diminishes as the stage shifts over to Noritoshi. He is still bullying Maki, but things are getting less pointed. Think less familial abuse and more Twitter argument. It is now just mentions of Mai, which is probably one of the last memories that will fade from Noya since she's Maki's twin. As we progress down, we begin to see the most prominent memories in Noya's mind and what remains of him. Mai and Maki and Toji. His disdain for them, perhaps his admiration, maybe both. Nonetheless, it's quite ironic and maybe even poetic that that is what remains of Noya. Truly, the last vestiges of himself are not even well him it is just a hatred that he carried around with him that and jealousy because if you think about it noya was deeply and truly a jealous person even with all of his gifts his stature in jujutsu world his privileged birth all of it think of how luxurious a life the heir the legitimate heir of one of the greatest clans in the jujutsu world must have lived despite all that Noya could only focus on the chasm that lay between him and those heavenly restricted. The absolute insurmountable strength that he knows he could never achieve because he is not blessed and not chosen. Noritoshi, on the other hand, thought little of himself except for his one singular goal, which he was trying to achieve for his mother, which is to become clan head. Unlike Noya, he's an illegitimate heir. While still born of the Kamo clan and name, his mother wasn't the main wife. His life was spent proving that he was good enough, taking orders, being a good heir, and yet still being questioned at every turn. Noritoshi's enemy was always the system and himself. His struggle is competing with himself, always constantly pushing to be better than before because nothing seemed enough. This is the exact opposite of Noya's birthright, the exact opposite of Noya's experience. Noya always looked outwardly, who he can make small, who he can fight, who he can look down on. And now that he's just simply a vessel for that jealousy, his whole existence is culminating into one powerful yet pathetic curse with a sole directive of once again getting to bully the girl he despised growing up for being closer to his true desires than he could ever be and it's actually kind of a sad realization to watch as noya grows less and less sentient and it is revealed to us the things that he really clung on to and we've had many many moments of death in jujutsu kaisen none by far though this thoroughly hateful. Noya and Noritoshi are foils of each other. This is why this is the perfect battle for this parallel to come to a head. I already said that Noya was always Noritoshi's what could have been. Not in the sense that Noritoshi is a hateful, unbearable, and misogynistic asshole, but rather Noritoshi if he had just continued to chase whatever the goal that the higher-ups placed for him, because the goalpost always moved. And if Noritoshi didn't look up, he could have found his hands dirtied from the jobs from the higher-ups, but he eventually found himself discovering the right path. 
Because where Noaya lacks self-awareness, Noritoshi has too much of it. Feeling like everything rests on his shoulders, where Noaya lacks the ability to admit Maki's greatness, Noritoshi devalues himself because of it. And where Noaya breathes his hatred for others so much he turns into a curse, Noritoshi looks at himself and decides his life is much better forfeit than to lose Maki at this stage. None of these are compliments by the way. While his decision to save Maki is, from a tactical standpoint, a perfectly logical decision, and Noritoshi, I think, believes that this is a tactical decision, this is a deeply emotional response to the way he sees himself. This is like doing the math problem solution portion wrong and somehow arriving at the correct answer. Noritoshi is being incredibly selfless. And now I, I wouldn't have called him selfish before because after all, all he was doing was for his mother, but there is a worrying degree to the selflessness in the way that he lives his life. He has widened that circle of selflessness now to his teammates. He is now viewing himself as part of a whole and therefore extended that self-sacrifice to them. This should clue you in on something about Noritoshi. There is something missing in him, and it is the knowledge of what he wants. When trying to decipher what people want, it is not the simple immediate answer that is the right one. You have to go a few layers deep and have some self-awareness. You have to ask why a few times. I think Noritoshi is at the stage where he still doesn't know what he wants for himself. And if you ask him, what does he actually want? He could probably answer a layer or two deep. He wants to help his friends. He wants to help them fight. But he probably doesn't know that it's simply because what he truly wants is to be able to have the acceptance and love he once felt. The memory he looks back on says that much already. He doesn't want the complexity of being a clan head. He doesn't even want the title. All he wants is a place for him and the ones he cares about to exist where they won't be harmed. And he wants to stand there with them, although he doesn't know it. It didn't matter to Noritoshi that the odds were literally against him. He put himself between Maki and Noya, making the active decision to throw his life away as he thinks back to presumably when he was the happiest. Meanwhile, this is a direct opposition to Noya, who literally defied death to bully his little cousin once more. Noya doesn't care about anyone but himself. I think you get the point, right? These two are opposites of each other. Even their powers are opposites of each other. Gege really went on the nose here in terms of how they are clear foils of each other. Noritoshi's power is centered on the biological, the organic. He uses his blood to fight. He poisons his enemies. There's an inherent portion of Noritoshi's power where it is literally giving a part of himself for the fight. Whereas the way that Noya evolved was from more organic to something more mechanical, something more detached and had one express purpose, to be a machine of death and destruction. You know, I had been saying that if Noya were to evolve a second time, he would evolve to become more humanoid. I don't think that he will ever get to that point. This is why. Noya himself is just an incomplete person. It's really interesting and telling that the intro of this chapter is Noya talking about the things that are second nature to adults that they forget that kids cannot do because I don't think Noya ever grew up. He was stuck in this limbo of petulant teenage bully and that was it. Even high level curses that we know of go through a point of growth. Jogo, Mahito, Hanami all believed in the philosophy that it doesn't have to be them that prevails. It's just so long as curses win out in the end. They had developed a certain sense of self-awareness that not all humans even get to. You only have to look at the state of global warming to realize that there are people out there who has not had and will not look beyond their own gain and turn a blind eye to the bigger picture. And it's always the people at the top. Noaya, case in point. Anyway, and I think that this very much draws an interesting parallel to the similarities and the coalescence of the evolution of curses and humanity. Noya will not reach a higher evolution without this, and I think he will never reach it. Solely because of this one fact, her spirits are 
usually a conglomerations of fears from different people and from enough derivation of the negative energy from various people they form their personality mahito's main directive was how much he hated humanity and it showed in his actions noya's curse only has noya to derive from and the well ain't that deep man he wanted two things revenge and the feeling of superiority and that only takes you so far from all the things that i've talked about previously you can see all the ways in which noya is lacking to evolve further means that his hatred for maki is simply that strong and it might very well be but i think at the end of the day he lacks the depth to do so the same depth that noritoshi is showcasing now Noritoshi fights for the goals and the group collectively, and he fights for others. And while this isn't a sure sign of evolution and the ability to survive the culling games, it's a start. From even here, we see not only the cognitive difference between them, but the tactical difference too. Noritoshi subverted the expectations that Noya had for him. Noritoshi was very clever in this fight. It was a simple trick, but it was the trick that Noritoshi needed nonetheless. He was always two steps of Noya at every single turn. Noya, on the other hand, was just underestimating Noritoshi, so he just went in swinging and hit Noritoshi, which is exactly what Noritoshi wanted. Noritoshi she spat out blood on Oya, taking care to get it especially on the parts within the Oya shell. And he used quite a lot of blood to do it too. For good reason though. This attack is quite powerful. If you look closely at the edges of the illustration, this piercing blood is not only going through glass, but the sides of the building that are presumably concrete or some other sort of stone. Noritoshi is pouring his literal blood, sweat, and tears in this fight. And with this final push, we glimpse Noritoshi's past. It's almost fitting that the moment he relives is the moment where he stands with his parents under the falling leaves of the ginkgo trees. Ginkgo trees symbolize resilience, health, and longevity, all of the things that Noritoshi is throwing away. He is giving up his life, not only replaying his happiest moments, but saying goodbye to all of the things that it stood for. Noritoshi in that moment sacrificed a life his future, the things that he truly wanted that he didn't even fully realize yet. He is giving his all to a future where he can help bring his friends closer to a larger goal that they have, even if it is without him. It is incredibly sad. The nobility of this act is hindered by realizing that Noritoshi, for most of his life, never really got to live it. And now he's content ending it for someone else for a dream that is not his own, but a task that is nonetheless important to him. But I feel like it's a cop out. And you might disagree with me, but instead of finding a new place for himself in a world where he has new people that he cares about, enough to risk his life and a new cause worth fighting for, he has opted to die. Noritoshi is at a crossroads. He is in a difficult spot as someone who has thoroughly lost his identity and purpose. We can tell this by his desperation and sheer will that he is throwing himself into the new mission that he has in front of him because he goes so far as to even bargain his life or really just throw it away. But I think that this gave him the courage to fight Noya in an all-out battle and ironically that may just save him. And this is why I think that Noya and Noritoshi are the true rivals in this fight because Noya is Noritoshi's what could have been. In this fight he is really truly and utterly fighting for his life his life that doesn't include the pressures of jujutsu higher ups his life that doesn't include the disdain of trying to become the clan head his life as he wants it to be and if he wins this fight which i really hope to god that he does noritoshi will come out of this as a different person as a changed person with new things to hopefully live for and aspire to. Now, before we conclude, I would like to talk about Maki. I almost cut this from the video because I wanted to center it around Noya versus Noritoshi, but this is so important. So let's 
talk about Maki's insane new buff. Maki can heal. As far as I know, this wasn't an ability that Toji had. Toji had physical toughness the same as Maki but I don't think that he was able to heal I reviewed Gojo's fight with Toji and it was honestly way too quick to discern if Toji had done any healing whatsoever in that fight so I'm going to err on the side that he was not able to heal this is an ability that is unique to Maki and gives her an even bigger edge in terms of the fight so far as we know RCT is the only way that people can heal and the number of people who can do it are few and far between and her distinct lack of cursed energy should have discounted her from being able to heal herself altogether. This is a massive buff, only slightly nerfed by the time it takes for her to heal. Five minute recovery time, while a miracle in the real world, is a considerably long time when fighting, unless there's a lot of running away and there is somebody there, Noritoshi, to give her a buffer. But also the amount of damage she endured is positively insane. That was basically the equivalent of a jet slamming into her. So all things considered, she's healing damn quick. And this begs the question, if Maki's time healing is proportional to her injuries, does that mean small injuries like bruises, sprains, or even fractured bones heal almost instantaneously? She took a significant amount of damage in that fight. This essentially makes it so that there is a threshold of damage that needs to be reached before Maki actually becomes injured, in addition to her physical toughness. Think about how insane that is for a second. That is passive healing. The only one we know so far who even has a slightly similar ability is Gojo, who expends such little cursed energy and only has the ability to heal himself. But there's something else though. Maki, without her rage though, I feel is more muted, or I guess you could say or maybe argue that no one in the Zenon clan could really hold a candle to her, and that fight for her was easy but I want to see her evolve to her full potential. Toji, after all, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Gojo. She doesn't feel like the one gifted with Heavenly Restriction right now. It feels like she was nerfed between her Heavenly Restriction being unlocked to now. And this is why this feels too soon for Noya and Maki to meet again. But I do think that Noya and Noritoshi meeting is the antidote we needed for this. But I am also working on the video as to why Noya coming back is actually one of the most important points of Jujutsu Kaisen. Crazy, I know. It'll be coming out soon. So if you're not already subscribed, subscribe if you like my content and click the bell to be notified when I upload that video because honestly, it's kind of a banger. Anyway, I'll leave it off here. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want more content, here is a video that YouTube recommends and I will see you in the next video. Bye.